The Lord bless you, brethren, beloved. Uh, welcome to another Bible study. So very good to have us in the house, not the physical sanctuary, but the fact that we're together, even though we are separated by space, um, together means that we are in some kind of uh, housing. And it's just so very good to greet all of us in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we are going to go straight into uh, what we have planned for tonight. Uh, we will be a little shorter than the normal tonight. You know, sometimes I stay a little long-ish, uh, but we won't go as long tonight because I am going to pretty much be picking up taking out something from what we had studied last week uh, where we spoke about the fifth column the enemy within we ourselves being a part of the fight a part of the challenge we know as we had explained uh, last week that as human beings we have to contend as human beings and as Christians, we know that we have to contend with the flesh. And if we are unaware of how sabotaging our flesh can be to our walk with God, uh, you know, we would be at a disadvantage. And so we had exposed that fifth column last week and caused us to appreciate that we have to recognize the role that our own selves, that our flesh, that some works of the flesh that we had already gone through, we have to be aware of how this will fight again, sabotage, tear down our walk with God. And so sometimes it is not uh, an outside force, although we have outside influences and outside forces fighting against us, all right? But we have to also be aware that we have uh, the flesh, the fifth column, fighting against us also. So it would appear, beloved, that we have warriors without and we have warriors within fighting against us. And so the question that was posed to me is how can we then win? Because we have the external influences, we have the internal issue, and everything is coming from us in both, coming towards us in both directions. How can we win? It's almost like uh, we are fighting a losing battle. But I want to encourage the child of God, I want to encourage the saints tonight that even though we have so much going against us, what we must never lose sight of is that we have more with us and more for us than those forces that are against us, those external forces and our flesh itself, which is the internal, the fifth column, we have more for us. It was the Apostle Paul writing, well, it was the Apostle John writing to the believers in 1 John chapter number 4 and verse 4. He says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And it is very important that we understand that scripture and that concept. It does not matter how great a force that comes against the child of God. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter how powerful, it doesn't matter how much it comes in like a flood. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. God knows how to take care of us, even though the enemy can be rough and over burdening, it would appear and seem as if he issues threats and we are going to lose, you're not going to lose. Understand that we are fighting a battle and the enemy is on every side, but we are not going to lose. So the Apostle John says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that ought to bring calm and assurance to every child of God. 
the Apostle Paul in writing to the church at Philippi also made a profound statement that is applicable to us today. And it simply says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it is important for us to understand that what we are engaged in, we can overcome, we can win. We are already overcomers. So it might appear daunting when we recognize that we have this fifth column and we have our own selves, our flesh fighting against us, sabotaging us in this race. When we realize that Satan through his minions are doing things and executing strategies to trip us up on our way, how can we overcome? Well, greater is he that is in you that is in me. And also the apostle said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we have this assurance. Be reassured. You are an overcomer. But that being said, it is very important that we appreciate and that we understand all the forces that are at play. The understanding of the strategies of the adversary, understanding of what is happening within you, understanding the things that we confront as children of God is very important. We have always said it and it is true we are in warfare and we must know who and where the enemies are and how they operate and that puts us in a position it gives us something now to say boy if i really try to do this thing on my own and or with 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 my flesh or i, I try to use my will to to just barge through and to keep on going it is more than just our will it is more than us we cannot do it without the lord without the spirit of the lord but with the spirit of the lord and with our being soldiers understanding strategies and applying all the things that we have been hearing and seeing i guarantee every child of god that we will make it we will be overcomers so this evening i want to as a, a kind of expansion, just talk a little bit about the spirits of the ages. Because, you know, a, a little discussion I had coming out of Bible study last week, and, and folks wanted to put some things into perspective. You know, when we talk about the flesh and all the things that happen, the, 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 the envies and the bitterness and and all those things that we touched on last week. They said that they thought these were things that were imposed on people by the spirits of darkness that lurks around and try to, and the fact is uh, th that happens also. So there is a outward influence, spirits of the ages that transcends ages that have been around from way back and believe it or not they are still here today i want us to understand something um, beloved and that's why tonight i decided to just pull this out to put some things into perspective that we know that when we start to see some things happening we know it is either ourselves or flesh we know it is either an influence external to us which influences are there we must understand that the spirit world is real and that what is happening in the spirit world in terms of those that occupy it that are opposed to god they are fighting against us in every way i want us to understand that while they cannot harm us right because we said it last week god has placed an edge and whatever the adversary does he gets permission only to an extent but he is able which is satan and those that work along with him to inject certain things into our minds to to create an atmosphere to create a kind of environment that will entrap and that will cause those that are walking with god to feel extreme 
pain and burden in terms of experiences that they have to encounter. Many of the experiences that we encounter, they are, they are, they are circumstances that were orchestrated by Satan. God allowed it because he can do us nothing outside of God allowing him. And God allows him. The Bible tells us that God sent a messenger of Satan to buffet Paul. And in that happening, he was humbled because what was happening, Paul was receiving from God revelations upon revelations. And sometimes even the most humble of saints, if we're not careful, we can become heady and high-minded. And God has a way of keeping us in check. But notice the Bible said he sent to buffet Paul, an emissary of Satan. How can that be? Because they are there and they attempt to buffet us. They do what they can in an effort to derail and immobilize us. And we have to understand that these things will happen. How then can an emissary of Satan, how can the, the spirit of, you know, the, the ages find an avenue to obstruct us, it can happen, and we are going to show us. So we're going to take a little time this evening to just to expand on a particular area so that we are more careful, that we are aware, and that we can introspect and self-examine so that we can all it ourselves and be clear in our minds when we see all that is against us to put our houses in order and to trust the living God and to understand the scripture that we quoted earlier on from 1 John 4 and verse 4, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And also the scripture from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We are overcomers, but we are going to find that we are bombarded on every side by the adversary. And even in the midst of this bombardment, I want us to be clear and to understand. I don't want us to feel that we are overwhelmed and we are barely making it through. No, we are not. Once we understand what and who we are up against, how they operate, the influence that they have, once we see what has happened over the ages and know that we are a part of this age and therefore will contend with the same kind of spiritual influence, then it puts us on our guard. It is my desire, saints of God, that every child of God, everyone in the house that calls on the name of the Lord, it is my desire that you be keen, you be aware, and you'll be fully prepared because this kind of preparation allows you to go from strength to strength, allows us to step from victory to vi victory. Don't feel that you're overpowered and overburdened and so much is happening against you and why did God allow this? You know, some time ago, uh, Kanye West declared to the world that he was now a Christian. And so many people jump up and down and say, see it, see it. Even those men have turned to, to the Lord and don't watch how they operate now because they have given their hearts to the Lord and people run up and down and leaving their churches to go Kanye West church and gospel this that he's putting on. And of course, the discerning ones know that many times these things, you can sense it from afar. You can easily discern the spirits from afar and know that this was just a fad. This was just the man going through an experience and saw an opportunity to put himself out there. Well, at the end of the day, you know, he, he, he recently sat and was in an interview. And of course, he's no longer a Christian, no longer serving the Lord. And of course, he outlined that he has a big problem, a big challenge with the Lord because when he was going through some issues, 
in his walk with the Lord. God never turned up and helped him. And so he has a big problem with the Lord and he's no longer walking the, the path. I don't want that to have to happen to any of us that we feel that there is no help or God never helped the way that we expected him to come. No, we must walk with the Lord and serve the Lord in the way that he wants us to serve him. He talks about faith. He talks about us going through certain things. He talks about the hardships. He talks about the, the, the trials that he's going to send our way. But then he also says that with all of these things that are going to happen from within and without, I'm going to be with you. You can make it. You can do all things. Greater is he that is within you. And he gives us all of these in his word. For those people that are li listening for God to speak into their minds and to come sit on a chair beside them. Hello, the word of God is already given and everything that we need so that we can strategize, so that we can appreciate what is happening to us, so that we can exercise faith. It is in the book. Woe to those folks who want to get advice outside of the book. The book is the book. It is the word of God. He honors his word above his very name. So it doesn't matter who the great persons are who decide to come in and cause a big excitement in Christian circles to say that they, those things are... They don't matter, immaterial. The fact is, whoever you are, small or great, if you are going to serve the Lord, you're coming in and you're going to have to abide by the word. It is in the book. If you, if you are dissatisfied because you expected God to do things a certain way and you're dissatisfied because you, you, you know, you're being bombarded from without and from within and you feel overwhelmed, hey, the book is there, the word is there. And the word brings faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Christians, we are going to make it through because of our faith in God and our trust in God. And he stands ready to help us through. But what are some of the things that we want to touch on tonight that is so important for us to understand so we can regulate our approach and we can regulate our mindset and we can be more aware of what is happening around us. What are some of the things I use today as a topic, the spirits of the ages? Because I wanted to bring some things to us. It is a kind of follow on to what we had touched on different, but it, it naturally follows because I want us to know that in addition to the things that the flesh does, the fifth column to, as a part of you, sabotage your walk, there is an influence that I want us to understand. You would have heard terms like the, the spirit of Jezebel. The spirits are the influence of Jezebel. And people throw it aside because they say, look here, we have heard those things. But those things are, can't be true because she was a lady from way back. And that was hundreds of years, hundreds, hundreds of centuries ago. And we are in a different era. People talk about these things, but there is nothing biblical about it. I want us to understand that there is everything biblical about some of these spirits or influences and they have somehow transcend the ages and as we speak today these spirits these influences that have certain things that characterize them are in our world and in the church today and we are going to show you and so it is important that we also understand what is at play when you come into church it is a serious thing it's not the dolly house that some others present out there and then some folks inside looking out and say oh those people have it so easy and we seem to have it so hard no we don't have it hard we're just going by the book i want us to understand it i want us to appreciate that living for god is a joy, but it is also a serious thing. It's not a mediocre 
fashion show. It is nothing like that. It is a serious thing where God demands a certain kind of walk, right? It's, it, it is so serious that Jesus used a term, a phrase, an explanation for us to understand how serious our walk with him is. He said, he that don't deny mother and father and brother and sister to serve me is not deserving of serving me. In other words, it is going to take, it is going to require some, some things very, very serious. And if you're unwilling to take some serious decisions as it relates to your walk with God, he's saying you're not even worthy to follow me. I want us to understand it's not a dolly house, it's not a plaything, it's not a playhouse. It is serious, and we are up against some spirits that are bent on destroying us. Not to come fight us and physically and up front, and you say a clash, and you. No, it is very subtle how they operate. And we are going to expose these spirits that even today are at work in the church, in saints in the church. This is not intended for anybody to be looking around, no one trying to feel out. Who has the spirit of Jezebel or who has Jezebel influencing them? It is not for us to be looking around to try to find somebody to condemn, to say that they have the spirit of Balaam and they have the spirit of the Nicolaitans. Which I want to bring it to our attention. I want us to understand what these things represent, how they work, and how even in a thriving church we can be, if we're not careful, decimated and so the aim and the intention is to expose these things so that we can know what we are up against and as individuals we can take remedial action but we're going to call out some of these things and this is so important but i just want to establish a, a build-up so that we can see that we're not just pulling it out of the air but i want us to see how from generation to generation, from era to era, throughout the ages, there is this constant march. And even though men die, the general friend and influence seem to continue, even though the individual men have died. The fact is, the spirits do not die. Men die, but the spirits in that world that we are not seeing. They don't die. And so you will find that some things just seem to just keep on from time to time. And we look back centuries ago and we see some of the things that were there happening is now happening today. And we say, oh my God, the more things change, the more they remain the same. No, the same spirit with the same kind of stuff. Because some demonic spirit, they are set with one particular purpose or a set of purposes. And those don't change. So those influences are going to be from generation to generation, trying to trip up men, trying to trip up the church. And you will have them as long as we are here. The Bible calls out some of them. We are going to expose them and we are going to call them out and we are going to have people to introspect because this is a serious thing. Your own Christianity depends on it. And we want a strong, vibrant, active, powerful church. Hence the reason I am trying to expose this so that we know what we are up against and what we have. So we're going to go on the screen so I can give us a little background and move into this as quickly as possible. As I said, it won't be the regular two hours that I am normally um, on, but I want us to catch very quickly. I want us to catch very quickly the, the critical, critical elements so that we are aware and understand and appreciate that this is not something that we are drawing out of thin air. These are what you'd call, we're presenting a scenario, we're doing a build-up so that we can 
properly appreciate, amen, what is happening around us. Now, we start off with this character, Nimrod, and we know that Nimrod uh, was that great and mighty hunter. The Bible in Genesis chapter 10 uh, speaks about him. When we read from verse 8 down to 12, verses 8 through to 12, well, we're not, we're not going to read it now. I just want us to see the scriptures. So a lot of what we are doing now, as we go through them, you're going to have to, some of the scriptures we will read, some we won't, because I want you to take the time and to read and to get a background, a full background for yourselves. So we see Nimrod, and he was described in scriptures as a mighty hunter before God. And his name literally means foolish, a foolish person. And possibly, perhaps the reason why he was called foolish is because of what he was attempting to do. And we are going to find that this attempt is something that others over the ages have tried to do. Nimrod wanted to bring everybody together, keep them at one place, and we would have known the story that he was behind the building of the Tower of Babel. Yeah, they were all together. They, everybody had one voice, one, one language, sorry. And they were under the common leadership of this man called Nimrod, a mighty hunter. Uh, and that word, though it was a mighty hunter, it had other meanings co connected to it. Uh, he was a great leader. And the historical references to him saw him as uh, the, the, the real originator of Babylon, right? The Tower of Babel uh, and Babel by extrapolation you get babylon he was really the man that was trying to get the world system together where he was a king above other kings a ruler above other rulers and he got them together had the same languages because at that up to that point the languages were not separated and they determined that what happened with the flood where all mankind was wiped out. That was not going to happen again. So he got everybody together and they decided in defiance to build a monument that went up to heaven. In other words, if God decided that he going to send a flood, we will be way above the flood. So they, they were truly in his quest for world dominance, which wasn't a big world at that point anyway. But nevertheless, it shows this mindset, this influence something was there from the very book of genesis where somehow men as small as the population was a, a particular spirit was there trying to tell men that look i want you to dominate and i want one person in charge i i, I submit to us that this trend comes from nobody but satan who know and by this time had the control over the system of the world. And as a result, he wants to have a man in charge that he will somehow possess. And through that man, exercises rulership over the world. He wants to have world dominance. He wants to have world rulership. A, a, a desire that he seeks and never will have. Though he's the God of this world and the world system, Countries are separated and countries have their own sovereignty and countries have their own leaders. And so he can't somehow exert what he wants as a ruler over the entire world and the entire world system. And so from the very beginning at the Tower of Babel with Nimrod, there was this desire. And as we, 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 we switch the slide, there was this desire to have world dominance. Well, God ultimately came down and smashed up the plans and the plans for governmental rulership under Nimrod was no more. It was destroyed. God, God confounded the languages. They went abroad. They were scattered all over the place and the plan was discomfited. Later on, we will see that Satan will have to an extent, and for a short period, that which he desired. He didn't know 
how and when it will happen. He's pushing for it, but everything is under the control of Almighty God. And so here in Genesis, we see an attempt for world rulership by one man being in charge, the man Nimrod, but it was smashed, that was thrown out, it did not happen. However, as we continue to look, we see a similar thing happening with Nebuchadnezzar. In, 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 in the book of Daniel chapter number three, verses 1 to 25, and you can read that again later on, it went on to say that Nebuchadnezzar built a massive image, uh, a golden image, very large, a large statue. When you look at the dimension, if you convert it to feet and inches in today's terms, it is about 90, was about 90 feet high, that statue. Now, 90 feet, you know, is not a small statue. It's two big 90 foot feet container, one on top of the other, just plus 10 more feet. That's a big thing. So it shows how these men see themselves almost like gods. They are clearly inspired by Satan. And he, look what Nimrod wanted. He wanted having built the statue, those that were called to the big event, all of them were to bow and to worship this image of the man. Every time that they heard the musical instrument playing, they were to bow down and to worship. And this was an image of one man, Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, he too wanted world and for that by this time, the population of the world was much larger. And there were so many other countries around, and he had conquered these countries, and he was their head. So now we see drawing even nearer to the possibility of one man running the whole world. But it happened in Genesis with Nimrod. Now we are seeing it here again in Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar. It was his intention to rule the whole world. But somehow, somehow, God just destroyed Nebuchadnezzar's plan. So Nebuchadnezzar eventually passed and the desire to, to rule the whole world, it did not happen because there were other nations that he did not conquer. And so he did not get to rule the world, but it was his desire. So we say the same thing with Nimrod. It continued over to Nebuchadnezzar. We, now we come over into the modern age with Adolf Hitler, and all of us would have known about Adolf Hitler. He wanted to establish a superior race, and what he did now, he rid the world of Jews, then he killed so many black folks, then even within his own country, those of the intelligentsia in high academic positions who thought for themselves and had mindsets that were opposed to what he was doing, Nebuchadnezzar, got, um, sorry, Adolf Hitler got rid of all of these people so that he could pursue his dream of being a super, the head of a super race and controlling the world. Of course, we know that by 1944, 1945, thereabout, World War II broke out and Hitler ultimately died. So that plan was mashed up again. The point I'm making, and see we're coming to the fourth one. Again, we hear of another man, the Antichrist. Revelation 13 and verse 1 spoke about it. And the book of Daniel um, spoke about it. That's Daniel uh, chapter 7 verses 16 to 24. You can take your time and go through because we're not reading them, but I, I've placed them there because I want you to have the material to take your time and to go through. Now, the Bible in Revelation 13, Daniel 7, speaks of a, a world governance system that is to come, that is going to make war against the people of God, and a, a certain man will have authority, and because and through the power of Satan, he is going to rule, and he's going to have authority and dominion over tribes and people and language and nation. So this is going to be the closest thing to the world dominance. In fact, this is going to be the ultimate. So he look at what was happening now. They had this 
influence over them from Genesis with Nimrod. Then you go over to Daniel in, in, with Nebuchadnezzar. Then you continue on into the era that we know about with Adolf Hitler. And then now we're going on to some time that is ahead of us with the Antichrist, what is to come. Don't you see something happening? There seemed to be a common thread. Something seemed to be happening. There seemed to be a common thread throughout all of these things, a common trend that right through from Genesis, Daniel, the era that we are in, in the 1945, 1945 there about with Adolf Hitler, right into what is to come. Revelation tells us about the Antichrist that is to come so that we can safely say right through from Genesis to Revelation, the same thing seems to hap be happening, the same trend, the same push as if there is a, a, a common purpose, and it is unbroken. It doesn't matter that they are centuries apart. It doesn't matter that one was in Genesis and one was in Daniel and one is in Revelation. Somehow that common push, that purpose for a, a, a controlled governmental system where one man rule, it was there from the very beginning. How could that trend, that purpose, continue so unbroken over so many centuries, over millennia. How could it continue just like that? I want us to understand, beloved, that there is a somehow a system where the spirit of the ages continue with a central purpose. You see those spirit that control governments like the the prince of Persia that we read about in Revelation that tried to stop the move of God. He cannot stop it, you know. But there will always be a fight. And that spirit, that prince of Persia, the Bible talks about the prince of Israel, the prince over my people, who was Michael. You have princes, you have forces that control governments that control countries and it is something i want us to understand they exert influence so that things go according to a certain plan where the mastermind behind it all as this in as it relates to the system of the world is none other than satan himself he has a plan that's going right through the ages and Century after century, notice the same thing keeps happening. The same thing happens in the church. The same thing happens in countries. The same thing happens among leaders. Just look at it. We just looked at a few just to give you an example. It happens over and over. Why? Even though these men die, the spirit behind what is happening, the spirits are alive. Because the spirits do not die. Their day is coming. And God is going to banish Satan and all the minions into the lake of fire. And they will be banished forever. But up to this point, they are alive and they are working and they have influence. Influence over people. Influence over God. Governments, influence over governmental leaders, directing them to make decisions for war and mayhem and to ultimately come to a point where there is this one world system that the Antichrist himself will rule and then he can declare, see, I have rulership, I am God over the... But listen to me, it is going to be short-lived. Ultimately, when the Antichrist comes, it won't even have a good seven years. He's going to have a much shorter time. And then God is going to, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to step on this earth and show who is really King of kings and Lord of lords. But Satan, throughout the ages, have been pushing his agenda. And they are coming together. And ultimately, you will have that one world ruler who will just last for a short time. But having said that, I was establishing a principle that the spirits and their purpose and their agenda transcend the ages. It doesn't matter if it was Nimrod in Genesis. It doesn't matter if it was Nebuchadnezzar in, 
in Daniel. It doesn't matter if it was Adolf Hitler in the 1930s and 40s, and it will not matter who the Antichrist will be in days to come. The fact is, the influence, the purpose is the same, heading to one ultimate location. And although these men die, the spirits are alive and continue to exert their influence. And it is the same influence as it was from, Neb from Nimrod in the book of Daniel. Now, I want us to look similarly at another activity that took place in the Bible and see how close they are. And you're going to see that, boy, it's as if things just repeat themselves. It's as if things just don't change. The more things change, the more it remains the same. Even the wise man wrote and said, there is nothing new under the sun. I want us to understand that because whatever influences were there from the beginning coming down, and I'm talking about world system now, whatever influences were there, they cannot change. They might subside and another spirit of another era come, but then after a while they're going to come back because the purpose is towards a certain end and to achieve that thing, if the spirit of the age was towards total mayhem and a, a disregard for the word of God, it started back there and even if it seemed to ease up and you have a time when people have a reverence for the word, you just watch after a while it's going to change again and you're going to find men don't even want to hear the word of God. There was a time, there was an era when people have respect for the church and now in this era somehow the whole thing changed and man will come in church and shoot it up, man come in church and kill people and these things never used to happen a couple of years ago. There's just this constant change depending on which spirit is more and which influence is required for the particular period. This is how things are. So even though people die and say, boy, in my time, thing was good, it was just a different era, a different set of spirit that controlled that period. And you look and see that this is exactly how it was. The Bible tells us in the book of Exodus, Exodus 1, and I have it here for you. You're going to take your time and you go through where Pharaoh commanded all the boy babies that were born to the Israelites, that they be killed. I mean, that sounds so cruel and cold and hard, but it is the facts. He commanded that they will be killed because Pharaoh was fearful that if they stayed after a while, they would multiply and become even more than the men, than the people of Egypt. And if you're not careful now, they would overthrow the Egyptians. That was his fear. And as a result of that fear, he decided to kill all the boy babies that were born. And he issued the command. And boys were dying left, right, and center. This is a fact. This is Bible. Now I want us to come M millennia, centuries after that event. And we come right into the time of King Herod. And what we see is the same exact, or very, a very similar thing happening, where the wise men came and they told Herod, hey, look, a boy, a baby is born, and this baby is going to be king over all this domain. And let me tell you, power and what Satan have put into the minds of these men drive them sometimes to insanity. I want you to understand that there was a spirit that was behind fear when he issued the instructions to kill the boy. He did not want that deliverer to come then and I'm telling you that was a diabolical spirit at work in the heart and in the life of the king the king of Egypt. Back over now to the time of King Herod in the New Testament. He thought that based on what he heard from the wise men and what they told him they saw in the stars, he did not want a king to come and overthrow him. So he decided to kill out all the baby boys from the two years old and back based on the time that, you know, he met and had his discussion, his discourse with the wise men because he wanted to make sure that he get rid of any kind of competition 
he was to be in charge. He was to have full control. This is how the spirit of the ages work. Look how far away Pharaoh was from King Herod. And they were influenced to do the same exact thing. I want us to understand the spirit don't die. The things that is assigned to them, that is attached to them, it will travel from generation to generation, from century to century. And that is a very critical point that I want to make so that don't feel that you are in a time no one, therefore it is so different from way back when they used to do those wicked things. The same spirit that would have overshadowed and pushed them to make decisions to kill baby boys so that their own purpose could be lived out is the same spirit that is alive and at work today, tempting and pushing and influencing you and I to do things opposed to the word of God, opposed to good godly living. It is the same spirit of the ages. And so having said this, it takes us right over to some things that I want to present to us so that we can appreciate what exactly and who exactly is at work. I've gone over this already so that we can, you know, we made the point, these men all died and we, we, we see that things are just happening. Things are just happening. Things are just moving. Things are just, and we are wondering why, how come, how? So having said that, there are demonic influences over mankind that we must never underestimate. It's very important. It has some scriptures there. It shows you how demons interact with people and what can happen. Some people become dumb. Some people become deaf. It doesn't mean that somebody who is dumb is demon-possessed. But the, the, the point is it is telling us how the influence when people are possessed what can happen, the kind of influence that the demonic realm, the spirit realm have over mankind. It's very important for us to understand that. Paul talks to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, and he talks about the, the, the spirit of the ages. In fact, I'll read the NIV version for you um, of 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. And this is the King James. Let us read it first. It says, no, this is, sorry, this is not the scripture that we that we want. We want the scripture in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 that the God, and this is the NIV version, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The point I want to bring out to us is that the God or the spirit of this age has blinded. Now, there is this particular age and there is the same spirit of the age and it is something that I want to bring across to us that as the ages go by, as the ages change, there will always be a particular spirit uh, of a particular age and sometimes multiple spirits at work uh, trying to get things to a particular place. And when you talk about the spirit of the age, what we are talking about is the set of ideas or, or the set of beliefs or the aims that is typical of people in a particular period in time, a particular period of, of industry, of history, sorry. You might find that in a particular period, there was this focus for uh, just worshipping a Baal and no matter what, no matter how you, people just want to, to, to surround themselves with a golden image. There is a certain, any country you go, even in Israel, the place where God had his throne among the people, after a while they somehow just gravitated to the gods of this world and everywhere, if you look at the more, the, whichever one of the heights you looked at, Whichever one of the acts that you looked at, they were serving a particular God. 
they were serving a particular idol. And Israel pursued. It was as if it, it somehow overpowered them. It somehow overpowered the nations of the earth. And somewhere along the line, they were just overpowered by these spirits of the ages. So a set of ideas or beliefs and aim that is typical of people in a particular period of time, a particular period in history. And that is essentially what we are talking about when we talk about the, 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 the spirit of the age. Now, I just made this point here to point to show us that Satan is really in charge of this world system. And hence, he's going to allow these spirits to take full control. It doesn't matter how beautiful the place is you want to go for vacation. It doesn't matter where you want to go for tranquility and quietness and anything like that. I want us to understand that this world system is controlled by Satan himself. It is for that reason that Satan was offering the kingdoms of this world and their glory to the Lord. He had to have a right over this world in order to offer it to the Lord. So I want us to understand so that you can easily see he allowing the spirits uh, that he has control over to have sway over the world system. You and I are in the world, but we are not of the world. But the world that is out there, I want us to understand it is controlled by Satan and he allows different spirits at different times to have a particular focus in his quest to mash down and tear down. And I, I, I can almost tell you without doubt, without fear, that we are in an era. The spirit of this age is one of rebellion and destruction. You look around what is happening in the world Everywhere that you look, you see a similar kind of thing, a, 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 a walking away from established authority, a walking away from the establishment. Any little thing is mayhem and chaos. I just looked at the television news and saw a, a small accident, a, a fender bender. And my God, when you see one man come out and the rage that he was in and mash up the windshield and stabbing after the other man to kill him, it is the same thing anywhere in the world. You go, the, years gone by, that wasn't the spirit that dominated. People were more calm. People were more easy to get along with. People were more accommodating. But somehow, it's a different feel. Everything has just changed. Everything is now different. Everything has been transformed. Totally, totally different. The spirit of the age, you find that it just changes and some wicked things. And let me tell you what we are seeing happening now, whether in Jamaica, this kind of reaction is same thing in America. It's just, it's all around. It is not new. This was around many, many years ago, when there was this aggression, when there was this no love, when any little thing sets off somebody and they'll burn down a place and they'll kill somebody and they'll just mash up the vehicle and set it on fire. Something is behind this in the world system. And I want us to understand that. So the, part, the point I'm making is this spiritual influence, it literally operates from generation to generation. So you might find one generation calm, but there is something else that is predominant in that generation. And you might find that generation that is calm, there is that spirit of lust and fornication and adultery. These things are happening, but it, because it is quiet, nobody is even realizing, but Satan is eating out at the fabric, at the moral fabric of, of society. So places are calm. But when you look at the background, there's a time when you look over in Sweden, when you look over in certain parts in Europe, look how nice and calm and quiet Europe was. But then when you look deep within, you find that they have, they have legitimized prostitution. They, 
right now in some countries in Europe, I believe Sweden are one of those places, you can sit and go to a corner in the open park where people sit down and walk past and just have open sex. And it is nothing, it is, it is allowed, it is not forbidden. You can just walk and see a lady in a mall with no clothes on and say, I like that lady, and you buy her or purchase her for the evening for the price of a dress that you would buy at a mall. It's crazy. And this was happening at a time we coming from far when things were quiet. So you might find a quiet time, a quiet, soft, easy era. But when you look beyond the curtain, you see some atrocious, ungodly, immoral things happening. The spirit of the age, and they are dear to dismantle the society in furtherance of the agenda of Satan, and we must be aware of that. But I want us to understand that this spiritual influence also impacts the church because it is the same Satan who has the same agenda to mash up the world he has the same agenda to mash up the church. But he knows that he cannot do it like that. Like this PLM that we spoke about last week. He knows he cannot do it like that. So he's not going to take a sledgehammer and hit the church. He's going to come inside the church and allow the spirits of the ages, which are dominating the world and causing the chaos and the mayhem and the hemorrhaging and the writing, that's happening in the world system. Satan is behind that. He has used now those same spirits within the church to bring about the same chaos and mayhem and rot and so achieve the same objective. So we want to now look at at least three of these spirits of the ages briefly so that we can understand and take our time and cut and sever and introspect and audit. Know that we have this understanding of how the spirits move. No, they don't die. Men die, but they don't die. So a set of people died on the ages. New people grow, same spirit, influence them. And that's why you see the same thing that happened with Pharaoh in Exodus is the same thing that happened with King Herod in the New Testament. Same spirit, same influence. And they do the same thing. Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, Hitler, just name them, the Antichrist, the people die, different men came up, same agenda. Why? Same spirit coming through the ages. One common objective to have a world dominant leader. And it is the spirit of the ages that keep it alive. That spirit of the age, those spirits coming through the ages, are in the church today. So let us look at the next slide as we try to quickly go through and wrap this up and see exactly what we can pull from this. And so we are at Revelation 2 and verse 20. And I, this one I want us to read. I want us to read Revelation chapter 2 and verse, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which call herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I want us to note, brethren, that the apostle in the book of Revelation calls out Jezebel by name. By now we know that Jezebel was coming way back centuries, centuries upon centuries ago. And so it couldn't be the same lady that is alive because she died. Remember, dog ate her. As we go through the scriptures in 1 Kings chapter 16, 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 21, we see Jezebel in all her might doing what she's doing. If you start to read, you're going to see how she took control 
of her husband, how she took control of the, 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 the leadership. She wanted to be the dominant one, the force one, the one in charge. And the, her husband wanted a fee, and he was sad one day because he couldn't get the place because the man wouldn't sell it. And she said, but look here, you are in charge. Anything you want, you are supposed to have. And she orchestrated the murder, the death of that man so that her husband could get the feel. What she wants, she must have at all costs. And as we start to read through, she sent threats to the prophets of the Lord. And she not only sent threats, she killed them. And notice now she brought in who she wants to be to boost her up and to hold her up and so forth. This, when you start to look at all the things that this lady Jezebel did, she defied the God of Israel. When she married to Ahab, she, all of a sudden Ahab started to worship her god Baal. So she introduced false gods and false doctrines. She introduced subtly until she took over and she took charge. Now while Revelation talks about you suffer that woman Jezebel, there clearly was a woman that was in church at that time doing some things that were wrong and were leading the people astray and was seducing even those that were in leadership, whether it is actual physical sexual seduction, which is a part of who she was, but then there is also the seduction in terms of the, the, the idolatry moving away from the established principles and so forth. The fact is Jezebel represented all of these. I want us to understand that it might not sit well with us to hear, you know, I mean, I know it seems difficult to accept that a church doing so well have fallen for the things of Jezebel. Now, the church here in, Reve in Revelation chapter 2, I want us to notice, beloved, it is a New Testament church. It has to be because it is a church and the church started under the Lord Jesus Christ in this era that we call the New Testament. And in this era, in Revelation chapter 2, we see the church here is being chastised. And this church was doing well. It was this um, church in Tithyra that in doing what they were doing and in following the Lord Jesus and in trying to stay the course and in trying to live the bible said that i have something against you yes it has something god has something against that church because you embrace jezebel down there clearly whoever the lord was talking don't name jezebel because jezebel was referring way back uh, you know, to that lady that had a spirit. But guess why that name was called? Because although the lady Jezebel was not there, the spirit, the influence, the things associated with Jezebel, that spirit that was dominant in her life that caused her to be that way, clearly was no. After all these centuries, exercising some authority and influence in a New Testament church. That is very significant. So that the fact that Jezebel was called out in a New Testament church, Tyathira, and they were doing their best and they were walking and God still said, with all that you're doing and I see some good things, the problem is you're entertaining Jezebel, in your midst, right? Here are some points. And it is important that we <clears throat> kind of look at uh, some characteristics. I call them characteristics of the Jezebel influence or the Jezebel spirit. One of the things we're going to say is that it operates through gifted and seemingly sold out believers. What are some of the things? We're going to look at the things, you know, in a minute. We tend to assume that a person with clear prophetic gifting must be blessed with a well-developed character. And many times, beloved, 
it might not necessarily be so. So God bless when somebody has the gifting and have the lifestyle to back it up because that is what we want. We don't want us to be suspicious of anybody. Yeah, because they are spiritual. Anybody that is spiritual, you know, that is something that we give God thanks for. We want spiritual people. But we have to be careful because many times the the the, the, the influence, the Jezebel influence, the Jezebel spirit, amen, it actually operates through people that are seemingly gifted or sold out, whether they are a good preacher or a good singer or whatever it is, the, 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 this spirit now hides behind that because people recognize you, people accept you, and then the spirit now starts to exercise itself and work in the church. If you are going to cause mayhem in the church, Satan is not going to go for somebody who the church don't know and recognize. He's going to go all out for somebody who one look up to. So he generally starts that spiritual influence, that Jezebel influence. And Jezebel, although that's a lady, the, the spirit of Jezebel, Jezebel doesn't mean that it is subject to a lady. It can be manifested through a man because it's a spirit. And so we're talking about some characteristics associated with the attitude of Jezebel. So it can apply to men, it can apply to women. But what are some of the characteristics of this spirit of Jezebel? One, we see it set up one person against another by a variety of subtle or not so subtle tactics. It's a spirit that's set up. So here is this gentleman that had his plot of land and wouldn't sell it. And without going into the details, she set up the king and those that were associated with the king against the man to the extent that the man was killed and his place taken over and given to King Ahab. It is a spirit that wants to have its own way and anything that it desires, it seeks to have even at the expense of others. So anytime we see a situation where within church, this one trying to set up this one against another person and this group against that group and you hear a little word around here so you know hear what happened here so you know hear what him say about you you know hear what she say about you and then you see it start to cause a friction somewhere in the midst of that the, the, the initiator is exercising the spirit of jezebel what it does it sets up people it it's people against each other to cause mayhem and confusion and division. Watch that spirit. Yes? The Jezebel spirit always appeared to be spiritual. It's always somebody who appears. When you see the person, when you see those that are exercising quietly, subtly, because they do it subtly, you know. But when you look, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you hear it and you, you, you just genuinely tend to want to believe it and go with it. Why? Because the person is a spiritual person. You always hear the hearing from God. You always hear God tell me you always, when I talk to the Lord, the Lord say that one. They always have this. And listen, we, so we have to be discerning. And the discerning, what we must be discerning, you know, is discerning our spirits. Those of us that are spiritual must know how to discern spirits. You won't always get it because sometimes God allows, because look at the church, as powerful and as good a thing as the church at Tyre was doing, the spirit of Jezebel was there. And things were happening, and they weren't even aware, even though they might have been aware of other things. The Spirit of God had to say, listen, I have a problem with you because you're not dealing with this thing that is there. You're allowing the Spirit to mash up some things and to affect my ministers and to affect, and he said, deal with it. So we have to understand the characteristics of this Jezebel influence, it always appeared to be very spiritual, 
but beneath the spiritual mass is an overwhelming desire to be at the top, to be number one, to be seen, to be the I am the real deal. And therefore, I submit to us, watch that spirit. That is a significant characteristic of that Jezebel influence, that Jezebel spirit. Now, point number three, there is an underlying bitterness. So it doesn't matter how the person seems to be gifted. It doesn't matter how the person seems to be uh, spiritual, like very spiritual, ultra spiritual. It doesn't matter. There is this underlying bitterness, you know, and this takes hold of them if they feel that they were overlooked for something, uh, some recognition. And then, of course, self-pity steps in and the person then seeks to try to let others see that, look here, look who I am, look what I can do, look, you know, they overlook me, but it, it, promotion comes from God, and quietly. So we have to be careful, you know, because sometimes men might overlook you, and if, if there are 10 persons and you see eight, and one or two get left out, don't worry about the deacon or don't worry about the minister, the elder, pastor, the head of the department who overlook you. I tell us something, even if men overlook us, I submit to you, once we are in the perfect will of God, whatever it is that you feel that God is doing in your life and doing for you, and whatever it is that God might have said to you that he is preparing you for, be humble, be persistent, be prayerful no man cannot take from you what god has for you i want every saint to understand that so that there is no root of bitterness and how they overlook me and how they leave me out because the spirit of the age the spirit the influence of jezebel will get a hold of you because they're looking for the the weak link that spirit is looking for the open door that they can latch on and they can feed into your system and that is how that thing so look here man be bitter because bitterness is going to lead to mayhem later on and it is going to cause this to happen and it is going to cause that to happen that will destabilize the person or destabilize the movement or whatever it is this is how the spirit work and bitterness push them to act against authority it is one of the signs of the jezebel influence when you find that you're anti-authority and that's if you look around in the age today everybody burning down anything that have to do with if you look a few years ago at the what they call arab spring and it happened in other countries. You see they're tearing down anything that gives some reflection of that, any government statue that had, they're just tearing it down and they use it now to go even further to tear down and to go against anything that presents itself as government that they don't like. They, they're just this thing that was just happening and they're just tearing down and pulling down and mashing up and rooting up. It is a spirit and it was just it wasn't happening just in one country it was happening right across the globe the spirit of the age and we have to be careful we have to be very 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 careful and number four it is a dominant spirit and it imposes its will on other people effectively making those people pawns to achieve their end so just i want us to understand how the thing works so there's this quietness there is this subtle move and at the same time it is dominant it wants to exert itself it wants to exert authority it wants folks to see that hey i can do this and i am good at this and i can and i can take charge and and at the same time that this is happening and the bitterness is there there is this oh no man everything like like you're just calm and easy very tactful if you're not careful you said no it can't be this man no it can't be this woman no it can't be this brother no it can't be this sister look this and i'm saying this not for folks to be looking around at other people to try to see which one of us have a jezebel spirit no this is not for us to look around this is for us to look in 
we must refrain from looking around because it is so easy for us to look at somebody else. Look within. See how we are motivated. See if there is any root of bitterness. See what our real motives and desires are. Because this influence is different from the flesh. But because the spirit knows how the flesh is, it pushes into your mind and says, see there, because it knows that bitterness is bound up in us. So it influences us to be bitter. It influences us to, to be discontented. And then to now move over to try to get others and to cause this conflict and to initiate this rift. And before you know it, you are at the source of division and mayhem and confusion and chaos. This is the spirit of Jezebel, the influence that she has. And let me tell you, fifthly, the spirit of Jezebel actually incites fear and discouragement in others. Do you know that there are folks that would go around? And I want us to be introspective, you know, because if you find that you go around, if you look at first Kings, you know, with Elijah, she, when she finished talking and said, I'm going to do this to you and more. If by tomorrow this time you are still alive, my God, the man run for his life. A servant of God. She, the, the, the spirit has this uncanny ability. Even when nothing is there, you become fearful because of the influence of the Jezebel spirit. The influence of the spirit. It causes fear and discouragement. Elijah became so discouraged that he became suicidal. And she wanted this to happen. Either you kill yourself or I kill you. The spirit, the influence of Jezebel. I want us to take time and introspect. Look at these characteristics and see in our own lives if we are demonstrating any of these characteristics with other people. Look good because the church of Thyatira was doing good. I don't want us to be having a thriving church and we're doing good and, we, and that spirit is alive in our midst. Jesus gave the instruction, deal with that woman. And I want us to deal with that spirit. If it is there, you start dealing with it. And then you leave the leaders to come in at the back end if that becomes necessary. When we deal with it is when if you don't deal with it. If you deal with it, it's all over. Satan has no control. And that is very significant. So then there is the, the, the sexual immoral part of that Jezebel spirit subtly trying to pull people into sin and to say that nothing is wrong with it. And the spirit generally tends to target leaders. And I want to submit to all of our leaders, wherever you are, be very careful of that seducing spirit. The fact that you are a leader, you are going to be exposed to that kind of seduction and that attempt to get at you. Because if a leader is caught into that, I guarantee you it will shake the very foundation. Whereas these might be um, nominal leaders, just look across and see the old scenario with Jimmy Swaggart years ago and what that has done to the mindset of folks who are interested in serving the Lord. It is important that we understand and the, 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 the adversary knows this. So he allows that spirit to exercise and exert serious pressure on ministers within the different churches. And that was happening in Thyatira. And I said, Jesus gets serious. I said, I have somewhat against it because you're allowing this to happen. Deal with it. So I want us to be aware and I want us to, 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 to exert ourselves 
to resist and to walk with Almighty God. So look at the pointers to see these simple characteristics in, in, in words. Control, manipulation, intimidation, shame, dominance, rebellion. These characterize the Jezebel influence, the Jezebel spirit. It's very important that we grasp and understand this concept. And folks many times are unaware of this influence in and over their lives. I want us to introspect, take time and recognize and deal with this influence in our lives. Very important. It is a part of the battle. You might be fighting and trying to do good. Here it was that the Tithyra church was doing good, but in this, and when we allow a little cancer, we don't, if we don't cut it out, it going to spread and the entire body, the individual is going to die. And it is important as we understand that concept. All right. So the next spirit that we want to look at, the next spirit that we want to look at, and we're going to switch over to it, the spirit of Balaam. And this one is relatively short, but it is very much existent. And the Bible speaks about it also. And this is why I decided to raise these particular ones, because they are in Scripture. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 12 to 19 speaks about it. The spirit of, of Balaam. Jude, um, verse 11 speak about it and it is important and so we're not even we're, in the interest of time you know because i know that you're going to take time out and you're going to read and you're going to go through the scriptures very important and it doesn't matter how much time it takes i want us to take the time read second peter read jude 11 see how it mentioned or they mention balaam but the origin of the balaam spirit and we had touched that on that last week numbers 22 2 to 24 right what did balaam really do all right, so we know the story. We know how Balak wanted to curse Israel because he was fearful that they were going to overpower them and deal with them, the Moabites, like how they dealt with all the other nations that they had um, passed through and warred with. And they, they totally discomfited all of those nations. So here they were by Moab and this Balak decided that no man may not when deal with them come Balaam we know you're a prophet and we know you can cast a spell a hex upon them and at the end of the day nothing that could come from the mouth of Balaam to curse the people of God could work because the people were already blessed but you know what Balaam did he incited the Moabites women to seduce the men of Israel by inviting them to participate in their idolatrous and immoral feasts. So they got entangled, they, 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 they allowed themselves to commit fornication. Brethren, the spirit of Balaam is subtle. He knows he can't get you to do certain things and yet something as serious as the uh, adultery and fornication he subtly moves and make it feel like nothing is wrong with just going to sit with these folks and be a part of their feast because you're not doing the thing but guess what normally happens when you subtly start to join with folks in immoral practices when you start you know you decide that hey this is nothing because i'm not going to do this i just here with them i know some folks say boy i want to win them so i go to the places where they go i, I remember one brother said he went to to bar because the, to the bar because he wanted to win the guy and him, the guy tell him to come to the bar with him and so he went to the bar to in the bar talk to the Lord, to the guy about the Lord Jesus. Well, before you know it, he started to drink with the guy. And the guy who was uh, used to the drinking, he was still sober. And the Christian, and this is somebody I know, he, he got drunk, right? He, so instead of winning the guy, the guy win him. You know that in, in, in history, this is how it normally goes. And that's why the Lord said, look here, 
Don't go down there. Don't join with them. Stay away from them. It is as if the Lord knows that once you would venture there, this is going to happen. For whatever reason, that spirit, not that the spirit of the Lord is not as powerful, but for whatever reason, men give themselves over. And God therefore says, look here, stay away. Don't look. Don't participate. Don't be enticed. Don't partake. And we normally would be the ones to go. So what Balaam did, the spirit of Balaam is one where subtly he incites you, he tells you, no man, not do wrong with this, not do wrong with that, until before you know it, you are into the thing. You are pretty much, what do you say, swept off your feet. We have to be careful so that that Balaam spirit push a kind of unholy alliance. So they said, no man, not do, wrong. not do wrong with nothing. He knows that he can't stop you from worship because you have it there. But if he can convince you that anything goes, no man, just sit with them, just be like them. If he can convince you that it don't really matter, if he can convince you to compromise, then like Israel, he will have you. The spirit of Balaam is a spirit of compromise. And you have to be careful. We have to be careful. And the Bible say, um, talking to one of the churches, talking to the church at Pergamos, say, look here, you have the doctrine of Balaam. And I have a problem. So the spirit of Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam, look how long Balaam died and gone. And yet still in a New Testament church at Pergamos, the Lord was talking to them there and, and chastising them because they have the doctrine of Balaam, which doctrine is to have the people coming together and say, not go wrong with it. Doing some things that they ought to do and say, not go wrong with it. Anytime nothing is wrong with nothing, and everybody wants to champion that, watch out. It is the spirit of Balaam that is at work. Because once nothing goes wrong, then we can't do it. That is where you compromise, and that is where you start, your standards fall, and that is where everything starts to get out of work. And I watch it even with some local church churches. Once we're apostolic with a certain whole, not that. You have to be apostolic. But they, they had a certain decorum and a certain way of living, both in their inward and in their outward. And as soon as they reached the point where they said, no, man, not, not wrong with this. We were holding the people in bondage. And, not, and everything they say, go, nothing is wrong. So nothing is wrong with nothing. So when you look at them now, um, even folks are saying, oh, gosh, I wish I was where I was before, because we don't understand that anybody associated with God, their speech is seasoned, their appearance is seasoned, everything about them is different, and it don't mean that you, you look weird and crazy and no, you still can be fat, but there is this modesty, there is this glow, there is this everything, and folks will know by coming into your presence that you have been with Jesus. The spirit of Balaam compromises everything and accepts everything. And before you know it, like Israel, how they moved in with the Moabites and they fell on their face and received the judgment of God, you allow the spirit of Balaam to take control, you will accept anything and everything and likewise will fall on your face. The spirit of Baal must be thrown out. And then there is the characteristic of that same spirit that is associated with greed. Be careful how you love money. Be careful how we love money and love gain. Even though we might know the truth. Some people know the truth, but they are willing to put it aside so that they might be elevated somewhere else. They are willing to set aside the truth for some material thing. That's the 
spirit of Balaam. He knew that he couldn't curse the people, but because he wanted the money, he didn't curse them, but he gave a remedy to Bel to Balak. I said, once the people come together and intermingle, they are going to sin against their God from within. But he gave the suggestion, yes, for money. Be careful of money and filthy look how the Bible put it. Gain. Be careful how you sell the truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. We have to be careful. So the church at Pergamos had to deal with that spirit. And likewise, beloved, likewise, we must deal with that spirit also. And finally, there is a spirit of the Nicolaitans, the influence of the Nicolaitans. And you will find that some of them overlap, but they might still have other areas spawned across the church. But I just zoom in on the, the key ones because I want us to know, because they are rampant in the church today. And when I say the church, not just talking about a local assembly, but in the church of Jesus Christ. But for the local assembly, I want us to look. I want us to examine ourselves. So we, we're calling it out and we're exposing it. So as folk can say, could it be me? Could I inadvertently be accommodating and allowing the influence, the spirit of Jezebel or the spirit of Balaam or the spirit of the Nicolaitans to have sway and control over my life? Be very careful because this is when we can lose out and don't even know that we're losing out. This is when we have some open doors and with these open doors, invite all these spirits to control because I want us to understand they might not possess you, but they can intimidate they can yes they can bear down heavily upon you yes some folks are depressed some folks are obsessed not necessarily possessed but you give an opening and all kind of things can happen some folks get depressed because somehow there is an attachment to your life as a Christian person because you have given way and space for this, these spirits of the ages to find a place to work with you. Get rid of them. Close the loopholes. Lock the doors. Understand that these spirits of the ages are at work. They were from way back if they were in the church of Thyatira and Pergamos and Ephesus. I submit to you they are in the church today and i just felt to teach on this so that we understand and we can look introspect and be very careful that you are not allowing any of these spirit of the ages to attach themselves to you so the spirit of the nicolaitans now the the nicolaitans believed in and they are in revelation chapter 2 also i should have had that scripture up there revelation chapter 2 uh because i want you to know that every one of these that i pulled up to present to you they are all a part of the new testament church they're in the church operating even while some of these churches are doing extremely good ephesus brotherly love powerful church and jesus said look here Watch out for the Nicolaitans. You hate their deeds. They were there operating and the church hated it. And Jesus said, I'm glad that you hate it. But they need to have gotten rid of that influence that was in the church. A thriving church. I want us to take note. I want us to bear that in mind. I want us to take note, beloved. Bear it in mind. So the Nicolaitans believed in a dualistic view of life. They believed that the body was evil and that the spirit was good. Because they believe in body and spirit, surely. But the body was evil 
and God therefore didn't care much about the body. The spirit was good and God cared about the spirit. But listen to how Satan is conniving and listen to the trickery of the, this particular philosophy. The body was evil and God did not care much about the body. Therefore, a Christian could do whatever he wanted to do with the body because it wasn't important. God didn't care much about it. No, if you hear that as a church teaching and that God only care when you come and say hallelujah, amen, but when you leave because the body is evil and the body is wicked, you know, just whatever the body do, don't pay it no mind because it is the praise that God is interested in. You know what's going to happen? Anything that comes to mind, and of course, you know what the body desires. The body is going to male and female. They are going to get together, this husband and that wife and this young one and that young one, because this is what the body, the natural man, craved, and the carnality would have been rampant. And that was what the Nicolaitans was, were teach, was teaching and was advocating and was actually living even while the church was thriving there in Ephesus. And Jesus had to come and put it out, open it up, call it out, expose it. Because it is a lie. And so the, the spirits are lying spirits that come to cause compromise fornication and adultery, carnality, and all the things that these spirits represent based on the names of the person who are there. So it wasn't Balaam that was there in the New Testament church. He had died. But remember I said, the spirits don't die. So what was behind Balaam to push Balaam to compromise? That same spirit now is here. And that is why it is called the spirit spirit of Balaam. It was the spirit that was behind Balaam. It was the spirit that was behind Jezebel. It was the spirit that was behind the Nicolaitans, right? And this, of course, as we said, led to fornication and adultery in the church and the argument that suggested that absolutely nothing was wrong, yes, with this kind of living because God did not care about the flesh. But God cares. God tells us how to live. And by itself, flee youthful lust, and let not any of these things be named, once named among you as become its saints. And if we do certain things, we must repent and come to God and flee fornication and abstain from this and run away from that. They are telling you that the, 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 the body is no good and God don't care. Well, if God didn't care, he wouldn't tell you to leave and run away and flee and all of those things. He wouldn't. He wants us to bring the body under subjection so that it refrain from doing these things so that the spirit man can thrive and then we can glorify God with a body that is a living sacrifice. That's Bible. So these spirits are there to, to, to set us off track, right? The, the, the next slide, as we close with that slide, which is the, the final slide, as we look at it, we find that what these, the spirit of the Nicolaitans were doing was to tell the folks that, look here, man, nothing is wrong with these things, so do what you're doing. See, the culture around there is doing that. It is, it is a bodily thing, and God is not interested in the body. They were inciting the folks to compromise and to be a part of the surrounding culture. Everybody is doing it. So who are you? Everybody is doing that. No, it might not necessarily apply merely to sexual activity. In this case, it was. But the same spirit of compromise that said, look here, you don't need to do this, or you don't need to do that. Or you're, oh, no, give and take, man, because this, this is how the, the 21st century is. This is how the postmodern world operates. So we have to shift. I, I, rem I heard someone, and it was brought to my attention what the person said, that look, we are in a postmodern era, and the Bible is outdated. This is a Christian, you know, and the Bible is outdated. So what we are to do are the leaders of this generation, they are not seeking the face of God because what they should be doing is seeking the face of God for God to download into them a word that can take the people through this generation and this time 
that we are living in. Hello, that is coming straight out of hell. For God is not going to download anything for this time. The thing for this time that we're living in is, was already downloaded. In fact, I have, I have the hard copy in my hand and it was already downloaded from way back. And anybody that wants a preacher to get new insights that is relevant for this time, because this is archaic, you look here, you're in the wrong place. Go, go somewhere else. Get out of the church. The church is not for you. But this book is the download from heaven. And it was good for the first century church. And it will be good for the last century church. Yes? Nothing new. Nothing new is going to come from heaven. This is it. This is definitely it. And I, I want us to understand that. And not just the New Testament in the book, but everything from Genesis to Re Revelation, it covers from the beginning and Revelation goes to the end. We are not yet at the end and this book is already at the end. So the postmodern era is somewhere between the two covers. Nothing more. And I want you to understand that. So be careful of the spirit of Jezebel. Be careful of the spirit of Balaam. Be careful of the spirit of the Nicolaitans. And let us do the checks. Let us make the balances. Let us do the introspection. Jesus said he hates the need of the Nicolaitans. That means he hates compromise. He hates fornication and adultery. He hates all the things that are associated with the spirits of the ages that we have just spoken about. Let us draw back. Let us close the loop, lock the openings, tighten up the links so that we can be overcoming Christians. And when the day comes and the trumpet sound, we make it in. God bless you tonight and we close for, he, for, for now. God's willing next week we pick up. But I just had to drop this in for us just to understand a little bit more about the influences that are there. Because in addition to the fifth column from within, we do have influences pushing on the weaknesses of the flesh and making it even harder for you. But thank God, greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. God richly, richly bless you. We are going to be closing in prayer at this time. Let us pray. Father, we bless your great name and we thank you for once again being with us. I pray, Father God, that you will touch and inspire all of our hearts, have us to introspect and to do what must be done so that our lives will be overcoming and be pleasing to you. Use these words and minister to some saints, mighty God, and let your perfect will be accomplished in all of our lives. We give you thanks, we give you glory, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. So the Lord richly bless you, saints of God, and we thank you for tuning in to Bible study again. And believe me, it, 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 it's a simple study, simple Bible study, but I know it is profound. I want us to understand because it is easy for us to have these spirits influencing us and we don't even know because of some link that is weak, some opening that we created, they latch on to us. I want us to understand that these spirits are aggressive and they lock on to us and you are there in church though doing that this is happening. Notice that every one of them that I spoke to you about tonight, they were in the church, in scenes, operating in the church, even while these were some thriving powerful church, Ephesus, brotherly love, and they were doing well, and the spirit of the Nicolaitan was there, actively operating. I want us to look around, and Jesus give us the, go ahead, you know, deal with these spirits in the church. Let us introspect. Let us be the one as individuals to introspect, to analyze, to pray, and to say, God, help me. And help me to close the doors and get rid of these spirits. They must not operate in your lives as individuals, in our lives as individuals, and they must not operate in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you tonight. See you next week, God's willing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.